Hello and welcome to the MBS Show Review. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silverquill. We have to kill the offspring. Oh, wow. All right. She's an alicorn. Ah! Also joining us today is Sapphire Heart Song. Being an alicorn means nothing, so I became the princess of bullcrap. <laughs> Aye, that stinks. And I did it by hugging blue blood. Basically, say my cadence became an alicorn. <laughs> uh... That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, wow. Well. Anyway... For today's episode, we are going to review, well, Season 6, Episode 1 and 2, The Christling, written by Josh Haber and storyboarded by Emmett Hall and Talia Tomlinson. How, is that how you say the word? You got me. Hmm? Uh, your, guess, your guess is as good as mine, senor. <laughs> uh, yes. I see I've mostly seen Josh Haber credited. Well... Uh, Josh Haber, is he the new guy or the new director for the sixth season? Not entirely sure. Megan McCarthy is busy working on My Little Pony, the movie. Mm -hmm. And Larson is not working for on season six anymore. And yet we still have large wings flying about. True that, true that. We're doomed. Anyway, this episode is the premiere after three months of waiting, which is considered to be really short wait. Most of the Brony reviewers are in a panic, and some of the fans are in the hype train. So anyway, uh, before we officially start, I think we should give our first impressions. First impressions? Well, I mean, first everyone's like, ooh, and then everyone's like, ah, then everyone's like, brr. <laughs> Oh, wait, you probably need something more than that. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm guessing you want to take the stage first, Silva? Oh, why not? Uh, basically, that happened. Mm -hmm. It's an episode. It was there. I'm a little sad at how, what a lack of reaction I have to this. Mm -hmm. All the princesses are involved. All the main six are on this adventure. Starlight has made a return. Spike is there. We get some new characters. And yet, throughout it all, I just sort of feel, at the end, I'm like, well, we were bouncing around so much, there wasn't a lot of time to solidify anything. All the ponies were talking about how important it was that Flurry Hart was born an alicorn. Well, great, you also have this new addition to your family. Twilight, shouldn't you be skipping in little circles right now? That doesn't happen. Starlight, you're talking to your old friend, and we know what's gone on in his past just from situation, but can we learn a little more? Can we flesh this out? Nope, because we got to get back to the baby. And then Princess Luna, Princess Celestia holding the line bravely against the encroaching winter. Uh, I'll have plenty to say about that, but they're doing stuff. They're still out of the picture, but they're doing stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and just by the end, you're like, all this stuff is happening, but it's like a donut. There's no center. There's nothing to really You have to hold. buy the donut hole. That's the that's the donut hole. I bought. I paid money for the whole shebang. Oh, then you should have a jelly donut then. Ugh. <laughs> uh. This is not, in my eyes, the worst season premiere, but it is the most low energy, mm. which makes me a little sad. All right, all right. And Sapphire, what about you? I'm just going to say this now. I hate Josh Haber's writing. Absolutely friggin' much. I hate it. I can't stand it. And, in a way, I thought I was going to hate this episode even more than I did. I mean, I liked little tidbits of it, but it doesn't have that satisfying feeling of a season premiere that hypes me up throughout the whole season. This, this is the first time I ever said to a season premiere, we're doomed. Although I did have a little freak out, Silver. I uh, showed you in PM how much I was freaking out over one little thing that we predicted a couple weeks ago. One of the parents freaking out. <laughs> the breaking point. Oh, yes, it's so satisfying. It, it definitely fulfills my sadistic needs for character mentality <laughs> to be broken. But it pissed me off when Cadence can get the same friggin' treatment. Okay, like let, here's some Ritalin. Just <laughs> take it and be calm. <laughs> I may or not be insane. <laughs> Alrighty then. Cadence, 
Will you please help out your husband instead of getting your little huff of cure, sweetie? Thank you. That's all I ask. Okay, moving on. All right. Um, as for me, I, I am pretty mellow with this season premiere. Throughout all of the five premieres we had, this one, in terms of risk and reward, was kind of in the middle ground, where it was kind of mellow. No real risk were taken, well, kind of, if you really think about it, and when you feel, because we all know that they're going to survive. This is just the first episode. They're going to be well. They're not going to end up doomed or anything else. It's the Crystal Empire. What could go wrong? The plot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but overall, I felt that this episode was kind of an okay introduction to Starlight. She had, well, we we went on a journey with her and we got a resolution with her. The main six were kind of in the background and the baby was kind of the B-plot of the whole show. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying that it's okay. I enjoyed it. It was not the strongest premiere, but it was okay. With that out of the way, I think we should go to a full review. And I think with this one, I think it's best that we go by themes instead of scenes. Agreed? I'm down with that. <clears throat> of course. Alrighty then. So anyway, spoilers are ahead. If you haven't watched it yet, pause here and do so. But if you don't really care, join us. We're going to go really, really spoilerish on this one. So in join us. <laughs> yes. So in terms of themes, um, where should we start? Should we start with Starlight? I think so, since the episode does. Starlight and her new main do. Mm, yes. Starlight. Oh, yeah. Why did they change that? Well, my head canon is that she kind of changed it in order to, like, kind of drop the past, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like, sort of find a symbolic way to change for the better. Kind of like how uh, Sunset Shimmer kind of changed her uh, clothes up a bit in Equestria Girls. That makes sense. That makes sense. Though the change does actually bring up the Sunset Shimmer 2.0 argument. Mm. Mm -hmm. Their names now look even more similar. Really? Yeah. Yeah, bacon Sun hair. So, well, okay, the bacon hair is, is uniquely patented Sunset. But Starlight yeah. does have very contrasting streaks in her hair. Mm -hmm. She's now curled a wave over her horn, just like Rarity. Sunset. Oh, okay. And Rarity. So, a little bit of both. Sunset was originally a, a recolor of Rarity. Really? Mm. Yep, earliest toys. Uh. But basically, this is the big thing working against Starlight right now. She is a reformed villain looking to Twilight for guidance, but so ashamed of her past. That is very much the struggle that Sunset went through during Rainbow Rocks. Now, the big difference is that while Starlight is beating herself up, Sunset had pretty much the whole school glaring at her. There's one scene in this uh in this two-parter that really emphasizes at least a different character trait for Starlight from Sunset. And we'll get to that as we go along, but by and large, right now there's too many similarities and not enough differences to help Starlight stand out as a unique character. Really? Because when I saw this episode, when I saw Starlight in her role here, I didn't feel like she was doing the whole sunset thing. It could be that one is a human and one is not, and the settings are different, but to me it felt like she's trying to improve and learning under the tutelage of Princess Twilight. And it feels like, well, this is a good place to start. She's being monitored by Twilight, and Starlight here is really, um, well, really wants to change. And she shows it in this episode or in this series. Other things that we will go further on is her actions. Like, she is ashamed of what she's done, and she really is sorry about her actions. And, well, her first could-be lesson was going to the 
Crystal Empire and meet one of her oldest friends. Well, everybody wanted that, and they're giving it to us, and she's not ready. I've always sort of thought of um, Starlight as a love child between Twilight and Sunset Shimmer, so yeah, it kind of makes sense that Starlight would sort of become Sunset Shimmer 2.0, although I wish that wasn't the case. I'm not really sure if there was a personality to begin with, but Starlight has sort of lost her personality since um, the season 5 finale. I honestly never thought this character was needed. I really didn't. I don't care about Starlight. And that's a real shame. Although I do care about Sunburst in a way. My husband, though. What? I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anymore. No, you mentioned the different settings. Sunset regrets what she did in the past, is learning lessons from Princess Twilight's friends, mm -hmm. and is trying to make amends for her past and learn new things as well. So the struggle they face is very similar in my eyes. The settings may be different. There might be a few extra appendages or not. You know, a few more legs, a few less arms. Oh, true. <laughs> but ultimately, it seems like they're facing a very similar struggle, and they both abandoned their old personalities to start more timid and remorseful ones. That's the thing that I disappointed me. Sunset was a stereotypical bad girl. There was no real personality to speak of. So having a more vulnerable, more remorseful uh, personality was very welcome. Starlight was a very ruthless, commanding personality. She was much more calculating and aggressive and had a plan that actually worked. Okay, it was equally self-sabotaging, in fact, but at least she seemed more in control. But in the end, when the series ended, Starlight was remorseful of everything. Like, she accepted her fate. If the princesses wanted to lock her up into, onto the moon or into the moon or whatever you want to say it, she accepted her fate. But the lesson or the punishment that she got was, we forgive you, but you have to learn friendship from me, Princess Twilight Sparkle. Okay, but then, does that mean all her quality traits uh, or her personality traits are abandoned. Because the one thing, uh, well, I guess we need to move forward to get to that scene I'm talking mm -hmm. about. The one thing that Starlight does really well is take command. She has a way of rallying ponies around an idea. She recruited a whole town. And yet, now that she's a student, she is no longer trying to follow that trait. And it's not a light switch. I have a very good friend who loves to take command of a situation, mm -hmm. even if she doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> I think for Starlight here, for me personally, I think she knows her bounds when it comes to certain situations. In this, we do see her having a commanding role or trying to manipulate certain situations. For example, the scene where she and Spike are going to Sunburst's house, and Starlight trying to not go there ASAP kind of manipulated Spike into telling the story of how he saved the Crystal Empire multiple times. And, well, with that, putty in my hand, I manipulated you so we can postpone this friendship meeting. So I think she still has it, but she knows when to use it and when not to use it. See, that's the one scene that, that seemed uniquely Starlight, that she was figuring out a way to get what she wanted and playing, playing someone. So that that is the one scene that I felt she was being more her own character than anyone. And I also do feel like, well, this could be my interpretation of the scene, but during the almost finale when Starlight told everyone that um, even though he's not a wizard, he can help, which, what else do we have to lose? That scene, it's like, it's either or kind of situation where if we don't listen to you, the crystal... Empire's going to be doomed if we do this into you and the Crystal Empire's doom. No difference. Speaking of yeah. dooming the Crystal Empire, let's talk about the child. Oh, yay, that one. That, that abomination that basically had the whole entire show cannon of Alicorns busted. How so? Oh. Busted up into flames. 
I just want to note the the polar extremes. Some people are like, oh, she's so cute, she's so adorable. Baby. Other people are like, kill the demon spawn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I I'm in the camp of oh, she's cute, and I can't wait to see further development. And I think Sapphire here is burning with fire. Oh, I don't care about how cute the baby is. I don't really consider it a demon spawn, but I'm just pissed at that one line. That just made me pause my TV and just go, why, Josh Haber? Why must you That's f- not a word! with me? Ah, <laughs> frag. Hey, sweetie, boy, I got a job today. But I think the infamous line here would be, the birth of an alicorn is something Equestria has never seen. <laughs> it's beyond even our understanding. Was that a, was that a chainsaw impersonation? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, this is just my face. Oh my. <laughs> I think to talk about Flurry Heart, we have to talk about the Alicorn first. Agreed? Sure thing. Alright. So the line, the birth of an Alicorn is something Equestria has never seen. It's beyond even our understanding. What do you want to say about this? Because it's open to interpretation. And Silver, the floor is open to you first, man. I uh, should be. I spent enough time on it. But... Okay, I'm going to take a very weird part on this. Mm-hmm. I've read the Journal of Two Sisters where uh, Celestia and Luna are, are they say that they are naturally born alicorns. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to cut, to weave a headcanon that they were born before the formation of Equestria and were just mature enough upon its formation to take over as defenders. Okay. The line also implies that there have been no alicorns born since Luna and Celestia. And pl- making me wonder once again, if there's a tribe, where the heck have they been? But here's ultimately where it comes down to, and this is also my view on Flurry Hart. She could definitely be cute, but I don't care. <laughs> she, she is... She forced me to acknowledge a simple fact. I love this show for its characterization and its comedy. I do not love it for its lore. My Little Pony is too loose and winging it, pun intended, with its fantasy, its rules, and its lore. Basically, I don't think even uh, Lauren Faust thought this thing was going to get past the season, so she didn't flesh out a lot of the background ideas. Why did Celestia give Twilight of All Ponies the spike egg for a test? Someone asked her about it. She said, oh, well, Celestia is just really smart. Why couldn't Celestia use the elements to... Force Nightmare Moon back to Princess Luna. Well, we never get a real answer for that. It's never explored. Basically, a lot of stuff happens just because. And in this case, Flurry Heart has wings just because they want to sell the new toy set. I still feel that way about Twilight being an alicorn. Ultimately, the reason she became one, even though her friends equally contributed to great success and accomplished their own amazing feats, is just because. Last week's episode we did talk long about the whole Alicorn thing, but um, I'm going to give in my head canon into what does this mean. Um, the line that Celestia said about the birth of an Alicorn, knowing how old Celestia is, I think she could be saying that they were the only two that ever existed. Um, other Alicorns, uh, for example, Cadence and Twilight, earned their wings. But Flurry Heart is the only alicorn that is naturally born after more than a thousand years or so, or even longer. So she's kind of a miracle or an anomaly. And here's something that Amy Keating Rogers um, wrote when someone asked her about the whole alicorn thing. And do note that Amy Keating Ranger is no longer writing for the show, and this is according to what she thinks personally. By the way, she did wrote The Diary of the Two Sisters, but to summarize everything, uh, Equestria was founded with Star Swirl and Co. Celestia and Luna are asked to be the princess of the new founded Equestria. They've now been princesses for a long time. During that long, long time, no natural born alicorns were born. Celestia and Luna didn't have foals. So, it's been a long, long, long time since a alicorn was born. So, they didn't 
think it was even possible. So this is all according to Amy Keating Rogers' theory or headcanon or how she interpreted the whole Alacron idea. Do note that she is not working for Hasbro or working for the studio anymore. So this is what she thinks. But she did wrote The Diary of the Two Sisters and, well, I think that carries water. Well, then there's me. I would have thought the scene would have worked better if Josh Haber had written down, like, there hasn't been a baby alicorn since us. Like, in a way. I would have accepted that headcanon. Maybe I'm relying too much on the Journal of the Two Sisters and that canon. But at the same time, the show writer wrote it before she left. And it's been established and installed in our minds for so long that it's hard for me to compute that Celestia and Luna are not born alicorns. Okay, I would have been fine with that if they would have given us some explanation on their backstory. Like, how did you two become alicorns? Were you earth phonies? Were you pegasi? What were you? Are you even really sisters? Like I mentioned before, Celestia and Luna were born alicorns well, about over a millennia ago. But that's going into hit. So you're saying they have Alzheimer's? <laughs> I Shame on know. you, Norman. How dare you make fun of the old person? They're over 2,000 years old. Come on. But that's besides the point. I think us talking about alicorn is going to last week's episode into how they were born and stuff. But on to Flurry Heart here. She's young, she's cute, she's overpowered, and, well, she has the trait of pound and pumpkin cakes. Good flyer, overpowerful magic, and able to destroy the crystal heart with a sonic scream. Overpowerful. And poor Pinkie Pie. She has no luck with babies. <laughs> yes. Between caring for pound and pumpkin, and then having Flurry Heart Tracker and Face Hugger... <laughs> <laughs> I think Pinky is about ready to take a vow of celibacy. <laughs> oh my. But Flurry Heart here, this was to be expected. Thanks, spoiler trailers for season six. But still. Oh, you didn't have to watch them. I didn't have to watch them. <laughs> Talk about watching the show and Ed comes in. Uh, unavoidable. Actually, in truth, I remember the buzz right after the one where Pinkie Pie knows people were wondering, oh, will it be a, will it be a, a colt or a filly? Will it be, it? could it be an alicorn? Will we see Cadence pregnant? All those questions seem kind of blindingly obvious. <laughs> of course it was going to be a filly. This is a girl show, princesses only. Of course it'll be an alicorn because that's marketable. Mm -hmm. And of course we won't see Cadence pregnant because that shows that being a parent has consequences. Your perfect body swells, it gains weight, you are carrying a living being within you, you do not get to be the supermodel. But but look at Cadence now. They will design an entirely new hairstyle for her at the end, main style. They won't have her have even a little bit of baby weight? Nope. I don't know. It could be cheaper. <laughs> cheaper, I, I guess, but it reinforces my view of Cadence is the perfect princess. And as the perfect princess... She can, nothing really impacts her. Nothing pushes her. I do kind of agree, but some mothers or pregnant mothers, they don't, they, they sometimes don't carry the baby weight. Like they do have it, but they can lose it really ASAP. But that's besides the point. At the same time, the filly was just born. Well. How, how she doesn't have the baby, baby weight is beyond me. You know how I was all happy giddy over um Shining Armor having his uh mental breakdown earlier? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, and we should talk about old Shining. Yep, yep. Well, before we do that, how come Cadence didn't get that same treatment? I mean, sure, there's the whole I'm a perfect princess type of archetype that is accounted for, but still, you should have some character in your soul. She did with the light shining armor. I thought you were taking care of the baby. <laughs> That's when I said, oh, uh, bleh, just 
I'm going to save it before Sweetie Belle scolds me again. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> but last thing on uh, Flurry Heart, or the baby. Now it reminds me of the Metroid baby. What the hell? Um, the baby. Oh, dear. <laughs> the baby here. Cute. Still needs a lot of development. We'll see what goes on after the premiere and see how things develop from there on. There's where the real development happens. As for now, she's just a plot device for, well, moving the story along. And talking about moving along, we got Prince Shining Armor. The chaotic father that is really in over his head with babies. <laughs> Because everything's so amazing, and it's also confusing, and all that other stuff, and oh god, my mind is broken. Which is, here's the thing, we can kind of segue with this, but Norman, you say Flurry Heart needs development, true, but she's a baby. Babies do not have huge personalities. Pound and Pumpkin even had but one trait each. One liked to pound stuff, one liked to put stuff in her mouth. It's babies. I'm not expecting Floria Hart to break into a, a soliloquy. To be or not to be an alicorn. That is the question. Whether it is nobler with the wings to go flapping about. But the baby needs is a step of development for the parents and the parents' loved ones to see how they will react. And here's the thing. Here's the, for the first time I'm cheering for shining armor because his introduction made no sense to me. The assertion that he's the greatest brother ever just makes me think of all the times he's not been there for Twilight. He's hardly interacted with his wife on an adventure, and he's never taken an active role as a prince. But as a father, he's the only one where this is having an impact, not because she's an alicorn, but because she's his daughter. He's tired, stressed, confused, in awe of this young life that is a part of his own now, but... Just so, what do I do? Because he cares. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is like, oh, she's an alicorn. Why is she an alicorn? Hmm, this is important that she's an alicorn. Shining Armor's the only one say, who's saying she's my daughter. <laughs> true, true. And we have to give points to Shining Armor for that. I don't want to uh, split hairs with Cadence and Shining Armor when talking about taking care of the baby because we are not entitled to see what they are doing Cadence does have a role on what she does, and Shining Armor has his role in, in taking care of Flurry Heart. Oh, please, we haven't seen Cadence do crap. <laughs> though, though the phrase is hostile, the, that is a lament. I, I can understand that, select, that Cadence would have royal duties that would interfere. But we but, don't see them. But here's the thing. We want to see development for Cadence and Shining Armor. The little tidbits of what we get to see of Shining Armor here is just awesome. We we get to see that he freaks out like Twilight when things happen. So that's awesome. That's cool. We do see him get into a panic. Yes, that's that's what we want. This reminds us of the comic version of um Shining Armor where he worries about every little thing. So that's good. With Cadence here, it's a bit of, we want to see development, but your Cadence from the Crystal Empire, we're not going to see much. We're limited to what you can do. In a shonen anime or whatever anime there is, if two couples have a child, we get to see their development. We get to see how they grow up. We get to see the parents evolving and taking that step to parenthood. In My Little Pony, where the main focus is on the main six and Starlight, I doubt we'll get to see that. Which again raises my question. When Twilight learned she was going into Celestia's school for gifted unicorns, she jumped in little circles going, yes, 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 yes. When she learned that uh, her brother was marrying Kate and she, was, she jumped and skipped around him, celebrating. Why is it that when she gets the letter, she just sort of says, I am now officially an aunt. It's like, really? That's... She did kind of freak out during the party. Party? Uh, the one pinky nose. Ah, I need to see that again because I can't remember if she really did the little skipping. Uh, yeah, me either. I guess it was su such a clinical declaration. Almost, She was almost just being analytical. I am now... I Just swap mod pie in with her reaction. You don't get much difference. 
I am now an aunt, Marae. But look at her eyes. <laughs> They're flaming with passion. I thought she just needed some Visine. <laughs> it feels like poor Twilight. Well, actually, the poor main six. I, I guess we're t- we can transition to them. They were present, mm-hmm. but they were not needed. I agree because, well, like you said, transition to the main six. Um, this includes Twilight for a change. We get to see them enter the building. We get to see them interact with the baby. And from that point on, once everybody got their assignment, we get to see, well, you got your standard team up with Rainbow Dash, Applejack, and Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, Rarity, and Twilight doing certain chores. We don't get to see the main six dynamic here. And, well, I don't think we get to see the main six dynamic here at all. Do we? Fluttershy comforts Rainbow Dash as she laments the stupidity of the Crystal Ponies. Oh, child, well, I have plenty to say about them. But uh by and large, there is n- none of their usual back and forth. The nice thing is this is the season opener. We are going to get the main six dynamic plenty of times throughout the season. Do but we really need it now, though? Do we need it now? But we don't, but then they don't need to be there. Exactly. They were sort of shoehorned in, and there was too much going on for them to really do anything to contribute with the plot. I mean, you could swap most of the main six out of the story, and nothing really would matter. Maybe it could. I don't know. It just... They just don't feel needed. Well, this reminds me of the uh, in Invasion of the Crystal Empire. Remember that? What was it called? Invasion or... Siege of the yeah, Crystal Empire. The Siege of the Crystal Empire. Because in that comic, we get to see, well, something similar to this, where the main six were there. But the difference here is we get a resolution of what happened to every pony. We get to see that Rainbow Dash, Fluttershy, and Applejack are trying really hard to get the townsfolk to go indoors and be warm. We get to see Rarity picking out the crystals. We get to see... Twilight and Pinkie Pie interacting with the baby and we get to see just about that. Other than that, there's nothing really happening with the main six. They're just there to be there. It was much the same with Cadence and Shining Armor's wedding. Ah, uh, yeah. In fact, oh, oh dear. It bring it, why is it every time we talk about Cadence and Shining Armor I get bad memories of the main six? Ah, maybe that's why I can never get behind this couple. <laughs> uh, I don't know. They were only characters for you. Well, oh boy. What about you, Seppi? What do you think about the main six here? I feel they're shoehorned into the plot with no Rhyme or reason. purpose. Mm. Yeah, like, I get that. It's the main six. They all have to be there in some crap because that's what the show is all about. Like, it's centered around these characters. But, there are way too many characters right now. We've got, we've got Spike, like, if we're not counting the main six, we've also got Spike in the story. We've got Starburst and Sun... <laughs> not Sunset. Starlight, but, you know, who really matters anymore? It's, there's also Cadence and Shining Armor and Princess Celestia. There are too many characters, and it's just... The main six could have been taken out, and it really wouldn't have mattered that much. Well, here's what I said from the very beginning. The story or the episode feels like it's been split into two parts, not including part one and part two. What I mean is, you got the baby plot and you got the starlight plot. When we watch the episode, we're more focused on or we're more interested in the starlight plot. The baby plot line is just there to be filled and it's creating chaos for, well, story reasons. That's about it. And talking about Spike, well, he stepped up a bit and he's growing into, well, a character. Oh, Spike, Spike shown in this. He was everything that he needed to be. He was the voice of uh, encouragement, the voice of shut up, Spike. <laughs> he was funny. He was helpful. He was insightful. He did a really great job. And it, it just reinforces my view. Spike is at his best when he's a support character because that's where he gets to demonstrate his best qualities. Mm-hmm. And a funny fact about this is a friend of mine, um, he told me something interesting where I would have noticed until someone pointed it out. And that is 
how Spike is becoming a bit like Twilight now in terms of we must do everything by the list. Because if we don't do everything by the list, things will go into chaos. And I'm talking about the list where Spike talks about the importance of the meeting. And the way he talks about it, it's like Twilight going crazy. Perhaps she has an infectious attitude upon her family. <laughs> Spike and Shining Armor are succumbing to the list. <laughs> There you go. The final villain for My Little Pony will not be a world devouring uh, magical monster. It will be a list mentality, <laughs> threatening to claim all of Equestria. Uh, I do want to to point out one contradiction in the in the episode, though, mm-hmm. because of Spike. At the end, when when all is saved and Twilight is is doubting her role as a teacher, Spike says, "Oh, you gave her the room to to do and learn," but Spike was there as an agent of Twilight the whole way, pushing and encouraging Starlight to go through with this. Is that really giving Starlight the space she needs compared to how Twilight started out? Now, granted, Twilight had Spike with her as well, kind of encouraging her to go with Celestia's plan. The issue is space. Are you really, are they really left to their own devices to learn? Or have you just swapped out one assistant for one teacher? Twilight did give Starlight the space that she needed to succeed in this mission. Spike kind of treats her as, um, you're my wingman. Like, you're going to help me when I need help. So, I do see that Spike is just there to, well, be the wingman or the wing pony in this case. And I don't see Spike as being Twilight's kind of overbearing shadow teacher kind of thing where she could be. Spike is really the agent, the factor, so I don't know if it's right to say that Twilight has given Starlight space any more than... Sil- oh, and my other beef is that, similar to having Spike go with Twilight to Ponyville and keep her on task, Celestia has basically always manipulated Twilight into the position she wants Twilight to go. It doesn't matter if she has, if Twilight has space, very little in her life has been her own choices. And it's when I say Celestia has played Twilight like a harp, I'm not sure that's really learning. I feel like Celestia being an expert at, at shifting the situation to her advantage. But don't call that space. Just call it she's really good at, at manipulation. Well, they can't do that. That sounds absolutely horrible for everyone. I don't know. Probably this is... Well, the whole Celestia thingy is just confusing. But talking about Celestia... Sunburst, one of Celestia's students. I did love that uh, that line from Celestia. One of my former students has a solution. I kind of felt like they were going to have a student off. <laughs> so Twilight, Twilight fires back. Well, my current student went to go get him. Yes, but my, <laughs> yes, but one of my former students is teaching your current student, <laughs> and I'm very proud of her. <laughs> One of my former murder students is actually giving you the solution to the plot. <laughs> uh, that, that could be something. Well, That'd be fun. Celestia's, Celestia's former student is actually, um, out number, like, what is it, uh, I can't say outnumber because that doesn't make any sense, but outclass Twilight when it comes to knowledge? Uh, probably, but. The way that Celestia says that word could be interpreted in many ways. And the most popular one is that Sunburst here was under the teaching of Celestia as her personal student. And I've seen something on Filmfic where there's a fanfiction where someone asks Sunburst, do you know Sunset Shimmer? I haven't read fully, but it sounds like an interesting idea. But that's one way of interpreting that line. The other is Sunburst just learns at Celestia's School for Gifted Unicorns. That's about it. So if Minuet was there, Celestia could have said, oh, one of my former students. You, you see why I'm going here? She's cl- yeah. claiming the credit even though she probably didn't teach any of them. I funded the school. <laughs> well, we never got to see Celestia teach Twilight a spell. I feel like that was a missed opportunity. But you know what? We we have talked about everyone 
the, all the main characters except Sunburst. And how I love Sunburst. Yeah, Sunburst. That is my husband. Don't lay off. <laughs> <laughs> I, in a, it's a bromance, okay? It's a bromance. Yeah. That's my new husband, though. I want to play with his goatee. It, it looks so cute. I just want to play with it. And oh my gosh, it's so cute. Why do I get the image of Sapphire acting like a kitty with his <laughs> goatee? <laughs> meow. Meow, meow, meow. Uh, okay. There you go. See, you've even got this voice down. <laughs> I actually would. Don't be surprised if I see someone with a beard. I just want to pet it. I'm weird. Oh wow. <laughs> Moving on past my weird, my weird beard fascination. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I I enjoyed Sunburst. Uh, first off, the flashback kind of set things up. He had all this knowledge, but it was Starlight who had the incredible magical talent. I mean, you know, he'll show her how to spell, and she'll do that spell times a thousand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which which actually ties into how she can compete on the same level with an alicorn and contribute to the spell at the end. But, oh, please, we don't need another alicorn. If Starlight becomes an alicorn as well, I'll know it's just a market sale at this point. But you see him trying to look the part of a wizard. You You get this rising sense of shame in him and that he never really let himself move on. My one disappointment was at the end, in this moment of triumph, which is mixed, because I like that he's overcoming his past shame and doubt to bring his knowledge to the table. But then he takes the spell that Twilight has painstakingly reconstructed from memory, from one viewing, which is very impressive, and he crumbles it up and throws away, saying that won't work. Okay! Jerk! You twat! (laughs) Uh, and that's why I criticize. Here is a male character in a show that typically does not flatter male characters. Usually they either need saving, um, or are evil or just stupid. And some will champion that's reversal of the tropes against women in male entertainment. Fair enough. But I've never been a fan of the idea that feminism or progress is just payback. Someone's got to do better or there's no progress. So this is kind of progress. But at the same time, he's not working with Twilight. He's giving her the answer and crumpling up her work along the way. I'd love if in the future they could sit down and wrestle with a problem together. Probably one day the opportunity is there since he is the Chrysler for the baby. Although if, if we stick to current MLP tropes, he'll disappear for ages on end, appear in the background and we'll... And we'll be lucky if he gets another speaking role. So mm-hmm. true, so true. But overall, Sunburst here, like him or hate him, he is one of the outstanding male characters that's, well, he's there. He's doing something. He's, he has his downs and he soon will have his ups. We're not even sure what he did at Celestia School for the gifted. Did he say that he learned all those things but can't do it? Or can't do them? I find that to be an interesting contrast between Starlight and Sunburst. One has the book smarts, while the other has the field knowledge. Like, if you know what I mean. Like, they can actually perform it without actually knowing it. It shows that you can't have one without the other, because if we see, like, Sunburst as he was, sort of a bum at the beginning, or whatever, because he couldn't actually perform the magic. It's an interesting trope. It shows a difference between the two that I really, really like. They work well together. Like, Sunburst here, his introduction was really, well, let's just say this. He, we like him. He made a first good impression. He's trying to compete with Starlight, which she is... Uh, Princess Twilight's personal student, and he feels like he's a failure. I don't know what to do. Like, I failed. And when meet with someone he cares about or is friends with, he starts to panic and weave a lie of, I'm a wizard. Yes, me. Yes, I'm a wizard. Well, well, technically, he didn't lie about that. He just 
enforce um, Starlight's impression. Like, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a wizard. I'm exactly that thing you described me as. <laughs> no, not really. Sunburst is a lot of fun to watch in this. and you, He's probably the character you cheer for the most, mm-hmm. even even more than the parents of the newborn. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's where I said plot A and B comes in. And we're rooting for Sunburst here. We want to see more. We want to know more of him. It's evil for me to say this, but season six should have been more focused on Starlight than the main six. Because I feel that if they were to shift focus to Starlight, it would have been really progressive, but it would have been a welcome change. We'll have to wait and see. We don't know how these episodes are going to play out. I'm not ready to say that Starlight is the seventh member of the main cast because of one important fact. She is entirely dependent on Twilight, her existence in the show. She is living in Twilight's home. She is learning lessons from Twilight. Basically, she's defined by Twilight. All the other cast were Twilight's friends and equals. They had their own goals, their own views, their own futures. That's what made them main characters. Right now, Starlight is a very prominent second-tier character to me. But one thing we've not talked about is the, <laughs> the actual conflict which I find hilarious. Well, that's because it was too dang boring. It was actually very underwhelming. I mean, uh, the baby breaks the crystal heart, which is impressive in that that thing got bounced around a lot during Sombra's uh, attack. And yet it held up just fine. One baby cry and you need a warranty. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, boy. Uh, but uh, this is the thing that drives me nuts. I don't like the Crystal Empire. It's up in the middle of nowhere for no reason. The ponies never do anything. You'll notice that every named character associated with the Crystal Empire, Shining Armor, Princess Cadence, Sunburst, Flash Sentry, you notice something similar about these ponies? They're not Crystal Ponies, but probably Cadence. Oh, not even her. She's not even Crystal by birth, it seems. Mm, She just has the Crystal Heart Cutie Mark butt thing. I'm still curious how she got that. Mm, but and it, don't tell me a Lovecraft story, headcanons. I don't know. But Norman has the right of it. They, for some reason, the Crystal Empire, all the important folks are not crystals. And it bugged me this episode that when I looked at the crystal ponies, like, ah, uh, they're not crystal. Not yet, at least. We've seen them crystallized daily in past episodes. Why are they not really? crystal now? Were they? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. When was it? You didn't know so. No, because are, uh, are, we games... talk, are you talking about crystallized? Po- oh yeah, yeah, translucent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I heard somebody like say, "Oh, they stopped being crystallized like when the crystal heart broke," but they didn't know that. Like, why aren't they running? Like, you know that scene. And then but the... they weren't crystallized even before the heart broke. Uh, yeah, I was about to say that if. Uh, they were crystallized when uh, they spread love to the crystal heart. And, you know, with the blue floor kind of thingy, I thought it was that. But during the game Spoonies play or the Crystal crystal Empire game thingy, uh, they were crystal. So that doesn't make sense. It's a noticeable hiccup. And then the fact that they, none of them seems to react that there's a blizzard storming in when everything we've seen is that there's never a blizzard like that. The Crystal Ponies are so passive in their own lives. They're so used to being sheltered. And it bugs me because I asked this question. Why are they living up in the middle of a frozen north where if there was no Crystal Heart, they'd all be frozen to death? And people are saying, oh, well, they adapted with Crystal Heart. Guys, this is true of real life. When you settle in an area where you are not equipped to survive... We fool ourselves saying that the houses we build, the shelters we make, the cars we drive are an adaptation. They're not. We think we're making the world adapt to us. And inevitably, tragically, it fa- those vehicles, those constructs fail. And we're sort of left to realize, hey, we are not equipped for this. And the tragedy ensues. And that's what's happening here. But everyone's like, oh, no, it's fine. No, it's not fine. What idiot said, let's go build a city in the middle of the frozen north? The kind that wanted to be a shiny rock pony. (laughs) 
Uh... I can understand if there was something up there that Equestria needed. A lot of major cities here in America started out as just ports of call or or trade route intersections. Or Las Vegas. But uh, what everything the Crystal Empire has always been is about light and love, light and love, light and love. You don't export that from Iraq. Again, why is it up there? This is the lack of lore really hurting what I think is a, a lot of good potential. Mm, true that, because when we take a look see at the Crystal Empire, it's technically a land full of Deus Ex Machina, where it's just full of disappointment, full of stuff. Like, you said it best, Silver, when we go to the Crystal Empire, prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> It'd be kind of cool if the Crystal Empire had a diamond mine that was very profitable. I, that's the thing. Nobody really knows. Nobody in the fandom knows. And I think even... No one in the writing staff knows. Yeah, I, nothing established yet. Nothing is really established. So when you mention um, when things are done in the States, like places are being built up because of X reasons, and like Vegas. Vegas is just a land full of heat, sand, and nothingness. It's just dust. The only reason why things were built up is just because, well, if you learn your history lesson, it's where people can have a lot of fun. So you have that as a reason. And, well, to say that the Crystal Empire is Vegas is, I won't say it's true, but possibly... Let's see here. Actually, I need to, I'm just looking up the history of Las Vegas because, uh, basically it, it really did start as a trade route. Once a city is established, it starts to take on its own identity. It becomes something different. Uh, California is now home to many cities that appeal for a diversity climate to be movie production, even though for a time it was all about gold mining. Well, I guess the movies is a different kind of gold mining yeah. now. Damn gold is in our hills. <laughs> yeah, how much how much has Batman Superman made, even though people hate it? Uh quite a bit. Yep. Uh but but here I am digressing. Basically, I just wanna know what was the motive for putting it out there? And people have said, well maybe uh maybe the frozen north encroached on where the Crystal Empire already was. Okay. Why did it encroach? Why did they not move? Why has no one made a big deal of this? And I have to say this, because the yaks from Yak- Yakistan were already there, and they adapted to the cold weather. Um, ergo, look at their thick wool and stuff, and how they live. So the ponies from the Crystal Empire, they're just there and doing what now? Yeah, they don't need to be the crystal, crystal ponies, they need to be the shaggy ponies. If they're shaggy and they have thick wool or just thick fur, I could understand because they adapted. That's how evolution works. To say that the Crystal Empire ponies are not affected by the cold when they're crystallized, I could accept that, but none of them are crystal here. It's all madness, I tell you. Madness. But crystal heart broken by a baby's cry, and I find it funny. Every episode... Featuring Luna and Celestia has to figure out a way to get them out of it so they can't solve the problem for our heroines. Usually, they're getting captured or defeated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Here, they're still losing, but they are giving their all against this untamable weather. Yeah. It's a far it's a far more positive depiction. It's better than what we got the last few times where um, either Celestia got kidnapped, Luna was just away playing video games... Or being tied up with vines or stuff. It's good to see them interact with the environment where they have to burst down snow clouds and stuff. But it's just wasted opportunity. It's too bad because I really, really like shiny rocks. <laughs> but oh well. Yeah. The, the Crystal Empire will rot as a boring, shiny place. Speaking of shining, when the snow was encroaching and everyone was in danger, I thought... Wow, if only someone could generate a shield spell around a city. All they have to do is say, he's so exhausted from being a parent, he can't muster the focus uh, to generate the spell. There you go. Mm. That's one obvious solution eliminated, but they've kind of forgotten what Shining Armor's for. 
Now that you mentioned it, it does make a lot of good sense. At least make him try to do it and fail because, well, I've been up for almost 24 hours. I haven't got good sleep. I'm taking care of my daughter, blah, blah, blah. At least we could understand that. People here who have kids will understand that fact where they sleep a lot, they poop a lot, and they cry a lot. That's their job for the first few years of their life. And the thing is, it still looks to me that, like, Cadence was looking for a book while her husband chased their daughter through uh, the, the library. It's like, okay, looking through books is not really Alicorn-specific tasks. Don't you think you could put your energies to better use somewhere? Like making a shield? Making a sh- well, well, I don't know if the cadence of shield would work the same, but going out and talking to your subjects and telling them get to shelter... Because the main six don't don't have the authority, it seems. Yeah, nobody really cares for them. But uh, let's end this on a good note. Because after everything failing and after we talk about a lot of stuff, the ending for this one is, I like it. I really like this ending. Well, it is it is nice that Sunburst helps save the day and all all is well. But mostly I just focus on that black spot moving towards the... The Crystal Empire. Ah, yes. Before we go into that, do we want to talk about how he um, make everything better? Well, okay. Who who here has seen the Dark Crystal? Jim Henson. Mm, not I me. I've heard of it, but I've never oh. seen it, and I feel bad. Oh, you all are dead to me. <laughs> oh, I, I've, I've heard ta- of it, and I know what you're talking about. I've just never actually seen it. Away from me, O oh Spectre. <laughs> but anyway, carry on. That was a nice little homage. When uh, Sunburst jumps up and inserts the shard into the crystal and, uh, into the crystal heart. But then he also has a spell that, that tamps down Flurry Heart's power. Uh, and I'm like, well, okay, it's a world of magic. It makes sense that they would need spells to curb rampant magic. But, that was like the big challenge to King's Shining Armor as parents. Here's this baby with great power. Now someone else solved it for them. I'm sorry, Norman. I'm I'm taking your happy ending and adding a bit of question. That was going to be her most interesting trait. It is gone now. <laughs> I won't say that it's purely gone. She will have her moments here and there. She is a baby. I'm just going to say that as for now... Uh, Flurry Heart here is just going to have one of those spasms like uh, Pound and Pumpkin. Probably they can teleport. We know she can fly. So, well, there's that. But it's going to be toned down a bit instead of having a Kamehameha wave destroying buildings. <laughs> As symbolized by the fact she sneezes in front of her grandparents and doesn't wipe them out. And it's funny. Uh, all the reviews I've seen have made very little notes about the fact that Twilight's parents finally get to talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I find it interesting that um Twilight Velvet and what's his name? Oh, uh, Nightlight? Yeah, Nightlight. They're yeah. voiced by their children. <laughs> Wait, what? You mean... Um... Tara Strong voices Twilight Velvet and Andrew Francis, who voices Shining Armor, <laughs> voices Nightlight. Uh, oh, okay. Um... That's, that's a really... Really cool nod, but at the same time, I also think that was um, due to lack of budget no, or no, no, something. No. I don't um, know. <laughs> in terms of male characters, they tend to reuse the same characters over and over again. So uh, that's kind well, of normal. Voice actors. Yeah, so voice actors. Oh, well, yeah. That's normal. But for Tara Strong to voice Starlight I... Velvet, that is rare. No, Twilight Velvet. Yeah, I mean, that's rare. Not Starlight. Sorry. <laughs> But you still get what I mean. Tara Strong voicing another character that isn't Twilight Sparkle. Yeah, that's pretty rare, considering her voice range and all that. Mm-hmm. Not being put into the show enough. Oh, no. Um, In terms of... The way I look at it is in terms of... Well, that goes to Andrea Lumpen. Mm, true. But in terms of uh the main star of a show, uh they usually don't ask them to do doubles. They usually are locked into one character and they tend to be that one character. Um, with this, it's rare to see uh, the show asking Twilight to do multiple characters. I am wrong when it comes to Terra because in The Fairly Odd Parents, she does 
Timmy Turner and also the fairy godbird, the baby. So they have her do that too. But that's a show done by Nickelodeon and stuff. So different procedures. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. It, it's okay. But either way, it, it's fun that they got to talk. But when people make a big deal, it's like, you know, it's it, it's nice. It's not a big deal, really. They haven't done a lot. Or rather, it doesn't make this episode stand out for me. Basically, at the end where they're saying goodbye, actually, I was kind of surprised. Twilight, Twilight's parents just arrive and Twilight and company have to get on the train. It's like, really? You, you don't want to hang out as a family? Bask in the glow of this new edition? Oh, well, we've got a new season to get to. Yep, yep. Huzzah! Yay. Huzzah! This is a very fun episode. It has its ups and downs. And, well, it's just okay for me. So I think we should go to final thoughts. So, Silver, what do you think, man? You know, given this talk we've had for about the past hour, it would sound like we really didn't enjoy it. There's a lot of contradiction. There's a lot of underdeveloped status. The heart of the characters is still there. I mean, you care about Starlight and her discomfort with her past. You care about Sunburst and his frustration with his history and his his self-doubt. You care about Shining Armor trying so hard to be a good father and having a Twilight-esque meltdown. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The main six are present, and there's nothing there that makes you dislike them. It's just that they feel a little more removed. So it's an enjoyable piece overall. It's just as a season opener, as a, oh, wow, it's not. It's just there. It's present, and we'll look forward to seeing if they expand on the ideas, especially a changeling in the Crystal Empire, presumably more to follow. Oh, my God. Is that a changeling? What, you didn't know? No, I'm just saying because uh, I'll I'll say my piece when uh, when it's my turn. All I'm saying is... We've had so many villains uh, reformed, either in the co- in the show or the comics. Chrysalis and the Flim Flam are the only antagonists still standing. Well, they kind of reform in the comics, the Flim Flams, kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's the comics, not the show. Uh, last night, last night, check, they were still fugitives for treason. <laughs> Uh, last time I checked with uh, Chrysalis, she was on the run. Last time I checked, Shining Armor still a stone. That would be hilarious. <laughs> uh, but still, but still. Uh, Sefi, what do you think, man? Oh, despite the fact that I seemingly like this re- episode throughout the um, review, I still don't like it as much as I want to. I want to like Cadence and Shining Armor. Well, I like Shining Armor especially, but I don't like everyone else. I want to like the Crystal Empire. I want to like all this other stuff, but I can't because friggin' Josh Haber, man. Josh Haber. I know I shouldn't, like, emphasize the writer over the episode itself, but considering the fact that I don't like Josh Haber, I sort of like this is my favorite of his work, if that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, that makes sense, yes. Like, this is my favorite... Of my least favorite writer's work. That's all I'll say. Alright. And as for me, after reviewing this with you guys, I, I am in the opinion where this should have been a new start for the series, where Starlight Glimmer is the star instead of Twilight Sparkle. It's a brave move if they did it, but it's a gamble that I want to see. Basically, if you just put Starlight in the starring role instead of Twilight, you have a fresh perspective, a fresh point of view, and you still can do the whole friendship thing. Instead of Twilight sending letters to Celestia, you have Starlight Glimmer doing the same thing to Twilight. And it'll be fresh, it'll be cool, it'll be hip, yo. Well, not that fresh, considering Equestria Games, where Starlight writes to Twilight in the journal. But oh well. I do want to give you props, Norman. That was exceptionally white. (laughs) <laughs> yo hip, 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 yo. There, there are mayonnaise factories less white than that <laughs> oh shut up <laughs> no, I'm, I'm proud of you I'm proud of you oh. I love how that's the 
only thing you care about. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> He's whiter than me. That's how white he is. Oh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, that's our thoughts. Um, personally for me, I do like it and I can't wait to see more of what they do with Starlight and Sunburst. But, um, that's our thoughts. And I think we should end this and get ready for next week's uh, review. But what are we going to do for next week's review, man? Well, seeing as how Starlight has taken a more prominent role, and she is the power of an alicorn, yet is not an alicorn. And there's been some debate about that. So next time, let's give her proper focus, talking about her history, her future, and her a little, maybe expand a little more on her role in this year. With the Ballad of Starlight Glimmer. Yay! That'll be awesome. And I hope everybody is looking forward to it because we are going to talk a lot about her. I hope we can do an hour's time of talking about Starlight. But anyway, that's for next week's show. Anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I'm Silver Queen. I've been Sapphire Hudson. And we'll catch you next week with another awesome episode review by us. We'll see you guys later. See ya! Adios. Bye bye. Ha! It cut out. All according to Kikaku. Did it cut out? I hear it. I heard it all yeah, the way. Well, on our end, or at least at my end, I heard it like cut out like slightly in the middle of the like. Hi! <laughs>